Well, welcome everybody to this talk from Stephen Gapps on domestic de defensive architecture in early colonial New South Wales. I'll just give a bit of a background to Stephen Gapps for those that may not know his um, experience and background. He's had a long standing interest in public history and the history of early colonial Sydney and has worked extensively in the heritage field as a consultant historian. He currently works as a museum curator and continues to write on his particular field of interest, which is the Australian Frontier Wars. His 2018 book, The Sydney Wars, won the inaugural Les Carleon Military History Award and Stephen's next book, The Bathurst War, 1822 to 24, is forthcoming with New South Wales Press in 2021. So it's with great delight that we are in the, oops, excuse me, that we're in the forefront of um, this early talk about dom uh, domestic defensive architecture, which is a component of the, of the book, The Bathurst War. And um, what Stephen's gonna talk about today is the inclusion of defensive elements in early colonial buildings and structures in New, Th New South Wales and how little attention has been paid from historians and in the heritage field to this area. Often these have been dismissed as decorative features, slit windows, stone walls and strong rooms, and they're surprisingly common features in remote homesteads constructed at the time of frontier war conflict or bush ranging in the early 19th century. Some were constructed at the time of conflict, some some with it fresh in memory and others much later attempting to evoke the hardship of the frontier. Right across the British Empire during the 18th and early 19th centuries, it was widespread practice to consider defense when building a domestic structure, particularly in areas where that homestead might become a rallying point in times of crisis. So in this talk today, Dr. Stephen Gapps asks us to revisit some of our well-known historic houses and to rethink the way we look at the context of this construction. My name is Bernadette Flynn and I'm the General Manager of Historic Houses Association. We're delighted today that this is a collaboration between the History Council of New South Wales and the Historic Houses Association. So Stephen, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Bernadette. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. I'd, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of where we all might be uh, online tonight, but here in Sydney, for me, um, in Marrickville. And um, my talk tonight, um, as Bernadette said, um, it's very early days for me in, in this, this research. So I, I wanted to make this more um, uh, a conversational uh, talk. So I'd love to, to have um, any questions. And I think Bernadette might be able to manage questions as we go. Um, if not, just, just hold on till we should have some time at the end as well. But um, as I say, it's very early research for me. Um, and I don't claim to be uh, an expert completely as yet in this area. But I, I guess what I wanted to get across is some intriguing uh, things that I've discovered and uh, possibilities about the future study of, of domestic defensive architecture. And to, and to, and to ask uh, you guys um, here tonight, you know, what, what experiences you might have or, or to make you, or to, to, to prod you into thinking about this kind of architecture. So I will go to the first slide, I hope. I'll stop screen sharing for a second. There we go. 
That's better. Sorry. Um, so from the, the late, uh, if we go back to, uh, back as far as the late 1500s, royal charters gave English adventurers sanction to settle in the Atlantic world. Now, during the 17th century, the defense of new British colonial lands became a priority. In the words of the Virginia Company's Charter of 1606, if colonists were to inhabit and remain, they needed to, quote, build and fortify. As historian Emily Mann has noted, the Avalon and Maryland charters of the 1620s and 30s encouraged settlers to construct castles, forts, and other places of strength for the public and for their own defense. A century later in 1732, new colonists in Georgia were expected to erect their own forts and fortify any place or places within their colony. And they were to furnish them with all necessary ammunition, provisions and stores of war. As man suggests, these founding documents meant that milita military preparedness was a responsibility as much as a right for colonists in North America. They implicitly warned these, these far-flung colonists that their future security lay principally in their own hands. Importantly, this need to build strong defenses, I, I don't think it should be seen as, in some ways as defensive measures at all. These forts and other places of strength were in effect an, an offensive measure to maintain uh, occupied and contested lands. They were a kind of a, a preemptive strike, um, often constructed before resistance had even been contemplated by indigenous peoples who were curious about the strangers in their lands. The study of Atlantic history, as well as the influence of the East India Company uh, in the Asia Pacific region as, especially has, has, re has recently turned to the built environment as primary evidence for trans-colonial histories. In other British colonies during the 18th century, domestic architecture, particularly in rural settings, almost always incorporated defensive elements. According to Louis Nelson's study of arch architecture and empire in Jamaica, the British colonial presence was marked by a profound uncertainty and unrelenting and anxiety that found expression in their architecture. Fortified houses in Jamaica <clears throat> were built during a long period of guerrilla war in the countryside and were often based upon Scottish tower houses or with a bastion room, often known as a stronghold or a strong room. These rooms would function as a normal part of the house during the day, but in an emergency could be transformed at a moment's notice. Bastion rooms contained all the firearms and weapons and could be shut off from the rest of the house or had loophole windows from, for firing from. Indeed, after one rebellion in Jamaica in 1760, there was an intense period of fortified house construction that was based on fear and anxiety of past events rather than any actual threat. During the following decade of defensive building, there were no further rebellions. According to Nelson, this fear of slave rebellion in Jamaica continued to shape architecture long after and into the 19th century. Now, historians have looked more closely in recent years into the transference of settlement patterns around the British colonies. There was a surprising interconnectedness between, for example, colonial India and Australia, often reflected in architecture too. When I was working on my history of the Sydney Wars uh, that occurred across the Cumberland Plain between 1788 and 1816, I didn't really consider that the role of domestic architecture in defense against attacks by warriors. I looked at the stockades and other fortifications built around the Sydney basin, but not the houses such as uh, at places such as Mulgoa, Camden and Appen, which in the 1810s were very much on the frontier of the colony. It wasn't until my attention was drawn to several buildings in the Appen district that I began to revisit such images as this one of Blyton, 
near Windsor and scrutinize them for defensive features. And you may be able to just see there in one of the outbuildings, uh, some slit windows. Now this, this image is, is of uh, Beulah Homestead near Appen in Southwest Sydney. It's important as a rare example of colonial architecture that is still in, at least for the moment, um, before it's surrounded by new housing developments, it's still in a rural setting, but there's something very intriguing about it. In an attached stone room at the rear, there is a narrow window. It is carefully crafted from sandstone with a well-cut groove for an external wooden shutter. The aperture flares out at angles to create a wider window on the inside. It follows the classic features and dimensions of rifle slits, often called loopholes, gun loops, or musket loops. However, in the 400 odd pages of the heritage report on this historic homestead, there are two words about the window, possibly defensive question mark. This image is of another stone building in the Appen area. It too has an embrasure or an opening in the style and dimensions of a rifle slit. A 2002 heritage report noted of this outbuilding on the vines at Appen on land granted to Moses and Michael Brennan in 1816, that the Western wall has an unusual V-shaped slit halfway up the wall. While this may be a ventilation slit, its position and width has led to local suggestion that it was a fortified structure and the opening is a loop hole. The New South Wales Heritage listing for the site notes, quote, the ruin of the granary building at North Farm is unusual in that it appears to have a loophole or a gun slit in the remaining section of the Western Wall. Although this can't be proven, it is evidence of a fortified, if, if it is evidence of a fortified agricultural building, this would be rare in a state context. Now, in fact, it doesn't seem to be that rare at all. I've now identified five similar features in buildings in just a few kilometers radius. It is possible as several decades of Australian heritage studies of early colonial buildings have rather disinterestedly noted that these loopholes were made for ventilation in granary structures, or they were Georgian decorative features. But there is increasing circumstantial evidence at least that they may have been made for other reasons as well. The first land grants of Durrawa land to settlers in the Appen region began in 1811. By 1816, there was a small settlement which grew throughout the 1820s. It's unclear exactly when these stone outbuildings were constructed. It seems to have been from the 1820s on according to heritage studies. But it is known that outbuildings of stone were often the first structure of importance in frontier districts deep in Aboriginal land. So too, we know that in other colonies such as Jamaica, the British practice was to build domestic architecture with defensive elements such as strong rooms. And we also know of hundreds of examples of rifle slits in frontier settings beyond Sydney. At the height of Governor Lachlan Macquarie's now infamous military campaign of 1816 that resulted in the Appen massacre, there were reports of groups of several hundred Ganangara and Darawa warriors roaming the district, raiding farms and attacking settlers. Between 1814 and 1816, a significant period of resistance, guerrilla warfare was occurred in, in the area. Just after a local militia force led by Magistrate Robert Lowe had been defeated by warriors at the battle at Razorback, settlers in the area fled as refugees from a war zone to the safety of the main settlements. Now, were some of these domestic defensive structures built at the height of this period of conflict, or were they built later, with this warfare still fresh in the settlers' minds? Were they built, like many other examples of government, military, and other buildings around Sydney, with several uses in mind at the same time? say uh, securing precious grain, as well as defense against convict uprisings, bushrangers, 
and Aboriginal attacks. My first thought about these narrow windows was to err on the side of caution and in line with heritage opinion. So I consulted a heritage expert who basically said that such embrasures were a normal feature of stone or brick granaries in the Anglo-European tradition. Apparently, the inner splay of the opening assists with air movement. And as, as most of the embrasures in the Appen district are found in granaries or storerooms, and the cultural background of the property owners led to the use of traditional English building forms, it seems they were distinctly agricultural in function and had nothing to do with domestic defensive architecture. So then I um, consulted a military historian and sent him pictures of the various rifle slit windows in several buildings. He felt the buildings were, quote, strong defensive structures of stone with gun slits built in. On the outside, these would have been just narrow slits that were difficult to target with a spear, while on the inside, the generous space allowed the traver to traverse muskets um, and meant that fire could be delivered across um, a wide arc. <clears throat> so in a recent um, article called Necessary Self-Defense, pastoral control uh, and resistance in, in um, uh, Naringiri uh, 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 wetland areas in Waltoa in South Australia. Um, several historians note that research into the fortification of colonial buildings in Australia has advanced recently, but that much of this research is marred by uncertainty with the purpose of the architecture being difficult to discern in the absence of archival records of oral history or other signs of use. They do note there are rare instances of concrete evidence of explicit defensive arrangements often found in late 19th century reminiscences by early settlers. Interestingly, this, this overview of buildings in uh, Naringiri country found a stable shearing shed uh, house with rifle slit apertures that were a surprising two meters above the ground, possibly requiring um, a prop or a step for their use uh, and potentially higher for better distant views, very much like uh, the openings at the Mount Gilead property um, outbuilding in Appen. They also note the narrow windows probably served as ventilation, common in the English bank barn design, where inst installation would mitigate heat accumulated from grain storage. As in the Sydney region, it's, it's almost impossible to know the precise date of the construction of outbuildings in particular, and whether these actually align with periods of frontier violence. But as Wiltshire um, and others argue, even if these structures were built later than the frontier violence period and for non-defensive reasons, they have become part of a cultural memory around this violence, becoming reference points that quote, that physically anchor cultural memories of frontier violence to certain places. And importantly, as um, Nick Gurich notes, this architecture also con constitutes material evidence of a vanguard of Australian colonization being carried out, not by the military or the police, but by civilian settlers. Were these rifle slits in some way referencing the history of the frontier war violence in the Appen district? My history work has been very much focused on the historical archive. The dis this discursive structure of the colonial written record of warfare and conflict in early Sydney. But archives, I think, also exist in things as places occupied by people. The few surviving remnant landscapes and buildings around Sydney may tell us more than the architectural expression of early settlers' aspirations and traditions, but also something of their fears as well. Now, recent frontier wars work has focused on the central west of New South Wales. Um, hoping to publish a, later this year a book on the Bathurst War, 1822 to 1824, the first war of Wiradjuri resistance. 
And when I began work in this area after realizing the extent of domestic defensive architectural features in the Sydney region, I became very much attuned to thinking about this around Bathurst and I kept my eyes open for it. One of my first ports of call was uh, local Bathurst historian, Robin McLaughlin. And I must admit, I was a little surprised when, when Robin said he had never come across any defensive construction or fortifications in Bathurst Township. Indeed, Robin was also surprised by this considering both the warfare in the region during the 1820s and the subsequent period of bushranging in the district. Now, This uh, painting of Bathurst in the 1820s by Augustus Earl confirms there was no fort or indeed no real fortifications at all in the township. Well, at least no fortifications in the traditional and in my mind, rather narrow concept of fortifications. If we zoom in to the township itself, in the early colonial context on the frontier, any structure at all had emergency defensive possibilities. Low earthen walls or sod walls could be a good defense. Buildings themselves were often, um, were often shelter from attacks from spears. Early colonial defenses around Bathurst, as in Sydney and elsewhere, were very much in the hands of those who were in the advance guard of occupying Aboriginal lands rather than the military. Indeed, any domestic buildings constructed between 1822 and 1825 in the Bathurst region were built in what can only be described as a war zone. During 1824, all contact between the colonists and the Wiradjuri people had been broken off and in effect, war had been declared by the Wiradjuri in 1823, when they told the Europeans they wanted to tumble down or to kill all the white men. All the workers in the outstations around Bathurst had either retreated to the township or were reported to be cowering in their huts, gathering arms for, protect, for, for protect, protection. More than 20 white, uh, Euro, white people were killed in raids and attacks over several months in 1824. It wasn't until martial law was declared west of the Blue Mountains and strong military forces swept across, across the countryside that the war ended. It seems the settlers and convicts, not the military, were responsible for a series of massacres that decimated Wiradjuri people in the area. Governor Brisbane lifted martial law in December 1824 and the famous resistance leader Windradine marched across the mountains to the annual feast at Parramatta to declare a peace between the Wiradjuri and the British. The effect of the Bathurst War on colonial architecture across the Central West, where a remarkable number of 1820s buildings survive, has not to my knowledge been looked at. There are many examples of defensive elements in buildings in the Central West. Yet it's a it is a difficult task to compile all these and to find more information on whether they were constructed with a mind to bushranging or to resistance warfare, or perhaps both. Now this, this image, this, the last one, and, and these um, are of a building at Kalula, just south of Bathurst. And they show an amazing dry stone wall construction with rifle slit windows carefully built into the walls. Um, unfortunately, I've not yet been able to research the site and it may have been a convict staging post designed to keep people in rather than out. Um, however, the, the, the apertures uh, you can see in some of the better preserved slit windows um, are in the style of, of rifle slit windows. So once I began looking closely at buildings in the wider district around Bathurst, it became clear there were indeed defensive elements in a lot of them. There are several other buildings I've identified that have various defensive features, for example, including the Lawson property, the Macquarie Homestead. The outbuildings uh, at the property called Mildura, uh, 
are interesting. This, this property was taken up by Samuel Terry after his first holding at Millamurra to the north of Bathurst was attacked by Wiradjuri warriors. It seems the outbuildings in, in this property that I haven't uh, closely inspected have rifle slit windows. It may well have been built by Terry with the conflict at Millamurra fresh in his mind. But again, further research is, is required here. Many of these properties that I've, I've seen uh, are in private hands and will take a deal of work to, to access them and assess them. So um, in conclusion, the discuss this discussion, we go back to the vines, the granary with the, uh, the stronghold window. Uh, this discussion of domestic defensive architecture is, is, as I've said, a very preliminary work one. I note that but, but there has been growing interest in this area and some recent important work in particular by Ray Kirchhoff uh, on the Queensland frontier war. Well, buildings are artifacts of, of human culture and they can be interpreted in order to understand a people and, a, and place better. This approach to architecture integrates buildings, peoples and landscapes in the production of cultural landscapes. There is, I believe, much more to be understood from domestic defensive architecture in the Australian context. A cultural landscape of how British colonists invaded, occupied and defended their incursions into Aboriginal lands can be witnessed in colonial architecture. So I highly recommend next time you visit an historic house to consider, to consider it in, in some, some fresh terms perhaps, to look at its location. Is it on a rise? Is there a stone outbuilding that could have been a strong room? Are there rifle slit windows? What is the layout of the house itself? Is there an, in, an internal strong room perhaps? There's many other def, uh, defensive elements that can be considered barred windows, shutters, just to name a few. Um, but most importantly, I think when, when we visit such places or write about them or assess their historical significance, I think we need to consider the context of their construction within the occupation and defense of Aboriginal lands and how buildings might have, have expressed colonist triumphs, but also their fears. So I'll end it there and um, and open up to uh, some questions that I think I hope Bernadette you might be able to to wrangle. Um, <clears throat> so if you have any questions, can you put them in the um, either the chat box or the Q and A? Um, I have a I have a question, Stephen, to start off with. I'm interested if in your process, you know, how much pushback you've had to the theories you're putting forward. Um, well, not, not a lot, not a great deal, except that, um, you know, consulting um, heritage people familiar with colonial architecture. Um, I, I, I I think they, the people I've spoken to remain open to the idea, the possibility, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I think they need a stronger case to say, well, it's not just decorative or, um, or functional for storage of grain or, or et cetera. So um, I wouldn't call it a pushback saying, no, this is, this is wacky theory at all. Um, mm. But as I've said, I think it's it's a project that has been that that people are taking up elsewhere in Victoria, in South Australia, and Queensland, um, uh, and it hasn't really taken up here. Um, but I think it's I, I think just the the little bit that I've done so far is providing quite a bit of evidence to say that this was um, you know a lot more than just. Um, granary structures, that there was mm. defensive purposes in mind. And, and it's just, it, when you look at the, um, the way that um, the colony expanded across the Sydney basin, I guess, um, 
buildings were always, always used for multiple purposes, um, you know, with, with storage and defense in mind. Um, official government buildings were. So I, and, and, and that is a given. Um, so why domestic architecture would not, would be any different, you mm. know, I, I, I don't see. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So we've got a question here from uh, Peter Hobbins, who asks, um, thanks you for your talk. Is your understanding that these fortified spaces were effectively bolt holes to withstand a short incursion of 12 to 24 hours or a more prolonged siege? The former seems more common on the frontier and in relation to bush, bush ranging. But if there was a siege approach, then would there have been some water source and provision store ready? Might these elements be represented in the surviving architecture? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good point. I, I uh, in other areas of this, the, the uh, instances I've looked at, at in other British colonies, that that those are key factors. There's there's water points. Um, you know, um, the storage of foods and supplies for sieges. Um, here, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm guessing um, that long sieges weren't weren't thought about, but but short emergency situations. Um, so that 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 would be my theory. But you know, I, I think a lot of research needs to happen um, to, to really work out any kind of patterns like that. Yeah. Mm. Margaret Brown asks, where can I find out more about the wars that you speak of, speak about? So not everyone is familiar with the wars. So maybe you could take a little bit of time to give a short overview. Well, well. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I was just throwing that at you. Yeah, no, that's all right. Um, well, the, the, the Sydney Wars, there's a great book called The Sydney Wars by, by, by me, um, which goes through the different um, campaigns and conflicts that occurred in Sydney from 1788, uh, right across the Cumberland Plain, effectively, um, up to 1816. So that's, you know, in the 1790s around the Hawkesbury, um, 1804 and five in particular around um, the Western Cumberland Plains. And then 1814 to 1816 is another period um, of warfare. Uh, to the south of Sydney, and that's the one that ends up in. You may have heard of the the Appen massacre, where where fourteen people were were killed and unknown wounded. Um, the 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 Bathurst War that I'm talking about, there, there has um, one of the reasons I'm working on that project is um, that it hasn't been recently written about. There's there's um, there's a a couple of books about Windred Iron. Um, um, the most recent one written in the 1980s, um, there's, there's a, an unpublished thesis that d deals with the area. But essentially, a lot of people's um, understanding of the conflict at Bathurst is based upon a 1971 uh, work um, about the, essentially the history of wind, it focuses on wind and iron. Um, similar in, in a way to a lot of the Sydney histories that haven't looked at the campaigns across Sydney as a, as a series of wars, um, they focus on Pemaway. Um, and I'm looking at Bathurst in a, a, a quite a different light and looking at um, other unsung leaders and war bands that operated in Bathurst. It's also a case that in Bathurst, people think of the period of martial law declared by Governor Brisbane as the period of war. In fact, it went on for much longer than that from, it really begins in 1822, uh, and there was indeed conflict well before that in 1819 as well. Um, so that's that's two places where you can read about Sydney, and hopefully in a few months' time you'll be able to read about Bathurst. Um, yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Fiona asks, you mentioned briefly the element of placement of buildings as a means of fortification. Have you so far found a pattern of strategic placements of the buildings themselves in your New South Wales research? There's definitely a pattern of um, uh, using hills, um, uh, hillsides near water, with nearby water, um, for homesteads and other buildings as well. 
Um, and now there's, again, there will be multiple reasons for this, but one that I think, and, and, you know, the view, the, the ability to, to, to keep under surveillance your, your, your lands, um, but um, being on a rise gives you some defensive options as well. Um, so that's, that's something, yeah, that, that is a pattern, definitely a pattern. There, there, there are other elements. I, I look, I'm not sure about other patterns just yet. <laughs> no. Yeah, <clears throat> we have a message here from Neville um, Potter. Um, the property um, he's interested in is Rosserville, sorry if I'm saying that correctly, near Goulburn, which is not a fortified building, but a fortified dugout near the entrance of the property, half a mile from the house. It's built in the 1830s, oh sorry, early 1830s, and it was probably built to protect against bush rangers. Is it unique? It didn't work in any event because the place was held up by Ben Hall. Is it unique? I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't done enough of a survey and I'm, I'm trying to focus on um, structures, buildings, defensive works um, and, and houses that, that may have a connection with frontier wars, not, not focusing on bush ranging um, per se, but often I think it will be the case that th there's elements of both in those, uh, those cases. And, and when you say Goulburn, early 1830s, um, you're very close to front, a period of frontier war conflict. Mm. Um, another question from um, Peter asking, I can't help thinking about the earlier Pakia settlers in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where domestic defensive architecture appears to have rapidly developed. However, that was in the 1840s. Might Australian practices have carried across the Tasman 20 years after the period that you're studying? Well, that's a distinct possibility. Um, these practices transferred across the empire. Um, people may be familiar with the, the, uh, a military um, tactic that was used in Tasmania um, called the Black Line, and it's become infamous, um, which was a tactic to basically create a line of settlers, militia, military across the north of Tasmania and sweep across the country and try and capture every Aboriginal person they could. Um, and it failed miserably. But this was mooted as, as an option before the Black Line in Tasmania in Bathurst. So these kind of tactics definitely get transferred around the different colonies. Um, and I'm sure other, um, you know, fortification efforts do as well. Mm. Uh, Margaret Brown, who asked about the wars before, has just given some feedback saying, thank you so much for your answer. There's so much, much that I didn't know that I must learn about. So um, you've come to the right place, Margaret. <laughs> and Ian Willis says, great presentation, Stephen. Oh, thank you, Ian. Oh, okay. Ian has raised his hand to, uh, are you happy for him to comment, ask his question over the speaker? Well, we could, we could try that indeed. Um, so I'm going to ask him to unmute. Good, um, good evening. Um, a great, as I just noted, a great presentation. Um, it's, it's opened my eyes to um, the possibilities of a whole range of things across the cow pastures that I'm interested in. And, um, I, and Stephen's comments and observations are, are quite astute. Do you, to what extent do you think um, it's, it's present in uh, properties other than gentry properties, for example, you know, those that obviously of stone, the more humble cottages? Yeah, look, thanks, Ian. Um... Yes, I, I, I didn't, um, I, I briefly mentioned outstations um, as places of um, uh, defence, effectively. Um, and at Bathurst, they certainly were. And you may be familiar with, with the, the slab hut and um, people poking, making quick 
rapid rifle slots into bark huts or building loopholes or, or, or holes in doors of huts um, elsewhere in the frontier. And I'm sure um, that would have occurred in Sydney and Bathurst as well. We just don't have that uh, remnant heritage fabric um, with us anymore, mostly. But I'm sure in, in, in um, particularly in what might have started, buildings that might have started as remote um, outstation locations um, could definitely have had very, very simple um, elements. But don't forget too, that a building itself, in my mind, is a, is a defense. A bark hut, the, the, the convicts, um, stock workers around Bathurst were simply retreating into bark huts. Sometimes I think they didn't have arms with them, but the bark hut, the, you know, the bark hut or the slab hut was some form of protection against spears. Okay, Any? is there any other questions? Um, questions, comments, observations? If not, we might um, we might bring the session to a close. Um, before we go, Stephen, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your book on the Bathurst Wars and where that's up to. And you've got a 2021 publication date, which is fantastic. Do you know when we might be able to come and see the book? <laughs> yeah, um, it would be one of the physical object. <laughs> um, I'm hoping for September this year, if mm. all goes to plan. Um, there's still quite a bit to do. Um, I'm trying to also trying to map out the conflict around the region. Um, there's been a lot of consultation with with community, with Aboriginal community, Wiradjuri people in the area, um, and with dis descendants as well. And quite a few leads that I've got to follow up, um, and rabbit holes that I've got to stop going down. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're getting we're getting there. So I'm hoping September. Fantastic. Well, well, um, we'll keep an eye out for that and let us know and we can spread that through our network network for your um, first book launch. Indeed, we may even host it. <laughs> or your second book launch. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie. Fantastic. So um, just got a message here from Cassandra, which you've probably all read. The session's being recorded. We made available in due course on the History Council of New Wales YouTube channel and HHA platforms. So um, Peter says, cheers and thanks again, Stephen. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. It's been really, really incredibly interesting and terrific. And I think it's fantastic that you're um, leading this um, um, innovative approach and really looking, you know, re really looking at, uh, information that's been around in the physical fabric that others haven't picked up on um, in New South Wales in the way that you have. And I um, really look forward to more people responding to your work and driving that further. So do I, so do I, thank you. <laughs> um, so we just had a, a comment here from um, uh, Keisha Lithgow say, thank you, I'll be looking I'll be looking at some of the local buildings with different eyes. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, well, I might um, close the meeting unless there's any further questions. And um, thank you once again, everybody, for joining. And thank you so much, Stephen, for putting this together. It's been, um, it's been a great delight. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.